And I think another critical kind of starting point is accepting your experience, not judging or criticizing it. I think so many people feel an emotion and then don't like how they feel and then feel an emotion about their emotion, right? Like that primary and secondary emotion. So if I feel anxious and then I'm stressed or worried about my anxiety, or I feel depressed and then I'm anxious that I feel this way, or I feel angry and then I feel guilt, it becomes this emotional inception of a feeling within a feeling within a feeling, and people can be debilitated by that. So I think it's really cultivating this ability to observe our experience and to accept it without judgment and to say, this is how I feel and that's okay. It's okay to feel this way. That is Dr. Jennifer Longren, and this is the Well Mind Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ben Coles. Welcome to the show. I am thrilled that you have chosen to spend some time with me today and listen to the show. I wanna start off by introducing myself and then fill you in on the plans for this podcast. I've been a professional mental health counselor since 2007 and have had the privilege of serving people in a wide range of settings. I began my professional counseling career working in Florida at a faith-based residential program for at-risk youth. I then transitioned into serving in a community-based mental health team where I would meet with adolescent clients and child clients and their families at their homes, at school, and other places in the community. I then chose to pursue my doctorate. My family and I relocated from Florida back to the Midwest. And while I was going to school for my PhD in counselor education, I worked as a professional counselor for a large hospital system in the Sioux Falls area. I provided outpatient, inpatient, and partial, partial hospitalization services to children, adolescents, and adults. I've also been teaching in counselor education programs since 2012, first uh, at the University of South Dakota where I was attending, and then later at South Dakota State University after graduation. Presently, I've shifted my focus professionally toward counselor education at Bethany Lutheran College in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, I'm the Director of Graduate Studies in Clinical Mental Health Counseling, and the counseling program is something that is currently in development here at BLC. I continue to provide uh, counseling services, however, I maintain a small load of clinical counseling work through Christian Family Solutions, uh, an outpatient mental health agency, and I provide supervision and training to counselors uh, on an ongoing basis. So that's me, and this is my podcast. This podcast is a new adventure for me, but it flows out of my passion for people, growth, wellness, education, and most of all, meaningful conversation. The primary focus of this podcast is to engage people in discussions about a broad range of topics related to wellness, but with a special emphasis on mental wellness. It's my hope and intent that the topics, uh, the people, and the themes that we cover during this podcast will serve to promote and enrich your understanding and practice of wellness in your own life, in your relationships, your profession, and in your mind and body. All right, so in today's show, I talk with Dr. Jennifer Longren about a number of different topics. We explore the mindset of self-care, identity as motivation for behavior, building meaningful connection in our time of distancing and disconnection, and how we can actually change our state. Then we also talk about things related to recognizing and dealing with burnout, and building sustainable habits for your wellness. Jenna is a licensed marriage and family therapist, a professor of alcohol and drug studies at Minnesota State University in Mankato. She is an expert on all things self-care. She's a mom, a wife, and my friend. Jenna's energy is so positive, and I love how she approaches ideas with such curiosity. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Thank you so much, 
Jenna, for coming on the show. I really appreciate you giving up your time and, and sharing some of your expertise uh, with me today. <clears throat> um, my first kind of question that I'm, I'm really dying to know is what, what is your number at for runs at MSU? <laughs> oh, that was unexpected. <laughs> I am at week five. Okay. I think I'm at... 17 runs 17 that I have done that you've done including yeah. today I ran a mile and a half you did it was very sad but I did it okay so I'm excited <laughs> about that yeah it's about accomplishing it right yeah yes that, yeah when um when we were talking before uh just about the commitment that you made to do this I thought um that was a a pretty cool thing because that's not I'd say that's out of the ordinary for you that's not something that like you've been doing for years and years and years. Yes. This is a, a new choice that you've made and commitment. Yes. So maybe maybe just get, what's the backstory? Okay. To that? Oh man. Well, I was I was athletic in high school, mm -hmm. and then somewhere along the line, I lost that identity. Mm -hmm. And even in college, my husband never believed that I was ever athletic, which is very sad. I was like a three sport athlete. Sure. And Sh I've, shame on him. I, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I was I was a jock, but. I think I've always thought about exercising as a must be nice for other people. Mm. Um, I looked at people exercising and I envied them. And I had so many barriers to just making that a habit. And for the first time literally in my life this semester, I, I made it a must because I felt like I had no other option to kind of be well without it, just based on my schedule, based on my commitments this semester. So I just made the decision, committed to it, and I have not faltered once, that mm -hmm. every day I run one mile at least. At least, yeah. And from there, it builds off of that. But so far, so good. Yeah, yeah. How, how are you feeling? I mean, since you've been doing it, obviously, there's uh, a little bit of a curve at the beginning, right, where yes. it's not that pleasant, but... Yeah, I feel great. And I think... I've, I've kind of, I'm really interested in hacking behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And I think my whole life I've associated exercise with pain and with embarrassment mm. and with, you know, not good enough. So if I picture going into a gym and I've had Y memberships, I've had Fitness for 10, I've had MSU, I've, you know, I always picture sort of, you know, I, I feel exposed and conspicuous and I'm with all these fit people mm. who are disciplined and I, you know clumsily hop on this elliptical or whatever okay. else okay and especially at msu now i'm like oh my gosh these are gonna be my students like i'm in clothes that i tight clothes that i don't want them to see me in and all of a sudden i, I really understood that if i associate it with pleasure i'm gonna mm -hmm. want to do it because mm -hmm. we as humans we we are driven to avoid pain and to seek pleasure just mm -hmm. at the very core mm -hmm. so all of a sudden i listen to my music I go in and I look at the people around me and I think, I'm so inspired by you. Mm -hmm. I'm with this community mm -hmm. of people who are bettering themselves. And also I'm wearing a mask. So they're not going to see me and be like, there's okay. Dr. Lundgren. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that that also helps. But now all of a sudden I'm getting like the physiological benefits of it, but mm -hmm. also just these other reinforcing qualities of the process of it itself, which I think has really helped. And that is what I've been searching for mm -hmm. this entire time is how mm -hmm. do I associate this with pleasure? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting how you, you talked about how many different barriers there were. And, yes. And it didn't start that way. Like it was very natural for you to be working out, exercising, training all through high school, right? As, mm -hmm. a, as an athlete, like that was part of your identity. And you kind of said somewhere along the way that got lost. And we take on different identities, new roles, new responsibilities um, as we age. And so this is kind of rediscovering that identity. I mean, because it's always been there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that it's not like it just disappeared, um, but it had gotten pushed to the side long enough that maybe collected enough dust that you couldn't yeah. really see it all that well. So um, I'm just curious how you made that switch in your mindset because that's really what where it started like yeah you made a decision and i'm wondering like what what was the process in in doing that yeah that's a great question i think that's a really great point is that we as humans also kind of strive to act in alignment to how we identify mm -hmm. and i think so i went to college for 10 years straight 
and I was really invested in my studies. And I remember that I almost felt like it had to be an either or. And I just also want to clarify that we I, I am pretty active. Like my husband and I bike all the time and hike all the time and we we get outside all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I just sit all day on my couch watching TV. Um, but I just remember in grad school almost having this thought like, I'm trading my own health for my studies and that's okay. Like I thought that I had to make that trade. Mm. And then as I was in grad school in my third year of my doctoral program, I shifted into becoming a mom too. And I also feel like we have this idea of like, we must give all of ourselves to our family and our children and that doing things for ourselves equals selfishness and time away working out is time away from my family and from my kids. And especially as a working mom, that that almost becomes more egregious, that mm-hmm. you're leaving your children again to do something for yourself, okay. which again is all internal. My husband would be like, yes, do it, go work out. But that those were my mental barriers, that this, it's not even pain because it hurts my side, but it's also, it's also selfish or wrong in a way that mm-hmm. if you have time, you spend it with your family and you connect with your, your family. Um, and I and I was very conscious of that too. Um, and I have gone to yoga classes and I've had gym memberships, but I, I could never keep it consistent because I was always pulled. So I really think that this year, re-identifying is like, I am athletic and I'm a good runner and I can be a mom and also be really healthy. Mm-hmm. And that's important for my identity as a mom. And I feel like shifting that, why am I doing this? I'm doing this so I can perform to my fullest in these other roles that I play. I'm a more vibrant teacher. I have more energy. Um, I feel more disciplined. I'm proud of myself. Um, I feel like my emotions are more regulated because of the physiological benefits of exercise, which we know are well documented. So it's almost like the shift that this is necessary for me to do the other roles that I have well. And it can be it can be integrated in my identity as a mom that I can still put my family first. But in doing that well, I have to have a foundation of wellness and of health and working out is a huge part of that equation for me. Yeah. So living an active lifestyle has that hasn't changed. You you continue to do that and you have done that, but you're really distinguishing this choice, this semester, this commitment to running uh, a mile every day you're on campus, um, you're distinguishing this as something different, yeah. as something unique. Then it's not um, it's not strictly living an active lifestyle, but this is a form of care that you are, are doing for yourself. Yep, and absolutely. Be, and, and because you're making that investment or that deposit, you're seeing a return on it in terms of energy, uh, motivation, engagement, and all these other areas of your life. Yep, absolutely. And I feel like in some way, you know, we biked a lot. We do bike a lot all the time, Mm -hmm. almost daily when we are in quarantine. Um, We do hike a lot. And I almost rationalize, like, that's enough. That's fine. We can go on walks. And that's, you know, better on your joints than running. But I still think that this active choice that this is my time and this activity is for me and I protect it very heavily, mm-hmm. that it it is different than other other ways of being active. So it's like this just this conscious choice that every day I do this um, and, and that I protect it. Yeah. And I can still be active, but but it's different than that. Right, right, right. This th- th- that activity is in part uh your relationships, right? Your relationship to your husband or your relationship to your kids or, you know, this is time that we're spending as a family together. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that's not the case for this. And, and whereas it sounds like one of the barriers was a lot of guilt mm-hmm. in the past over wanting to have that time, but not really feeling justified in, in granting it. Yep. You've been able to find a way to give yourself permission to do that and really um, even even uh, affirm yourself sure. in doing that. Sure. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I know I know that um self-care is not something that you just kind of do for yourself, um but it's something that you talk a lot about with other people um as a educator, um as a marriage and family therapist, um uh, a presenter. I know that this is a topic that that you've spent some time working on with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about 
some of the ways in which you have incorporated self-care into your uh, kind of professional identity as well? Sure, absolutely. I love this topic. I think this is so relevant, especially now in mm -hmm. in our current climate of COVID and of a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety, a lot of just kind of uncertainty that has been come to the, that has come to the surface. So in my full-time job, what I do is I educate counselors. So I educate people who are going to work with clients with addiction. And that's a particularly challenging population. It has a high burnout rate. Um, it, there's a lot of recidivism with addiction. And it, there's a lot of trauma and tragedy that, that happens in the stories of these clients. So what I was seeing, my program grew, has grown significantly. And I'm working with a lot of young students who are really passionate about the idea and they love learning about drugs and about addiction and mental health. But really in going into the field, what I was finding is during internship, it was almost like a crisis and that they were having these problems and just getting burned out, having having their own traumas being triggered. Um, it's just not, it wasn't, you know, this passionate, exciting field that they were expecting. It was it's draining and it's sad and there's a lot of paperwork and I was just seeing high burnout and kind of like mini identity crises. So I realized that it was it was my obligation or my my duty to really help these students develop a set of strategies that they could use to cope, to gain insight into their own past and their own values and beliefs and really have a set of strategies for them to go into the field well prepared to encounter what they were going to encounter. And I started doing this by asking a lot of people. So I have guest speakers come in and I say, self-care, it's a great topic. Like, what do you do? And I, what I was finding is people would say, I work out or I hang out with my friends. I have time between my drive home from my office and, and my house. And I just, it was more of like, here are things you can do. And I just wasn't finding the answer that I wanted. I feel like I wanted more. Like, what can I teach my students? Like, what are mental ways, mental strategies? Not just like yoga with Adrian, eat healthy, get sleep, you know, pray. Like, that's great. And those are all good strategies. But I wanted more of like the mindset. And that's really what I sought to hack and sought to discover. Um, so I... I did a lot of research and I like, you know, jumped into the self-help research, which I which I love and I'm kind of addicted to it now. I listen to podcasts all the time. Um, but that was really why the process started is because I was noticing that my students are burning out. And I think clients need counselors who are stable and compassionate and who aren't in survival mode. And that's what I was seeing is that when people are overwhelmed, they get in survival mode. And when that happens, you lose your capacity for empathy and creativity and critical thinking. And, and it becomes about yourself and your own needs not being met, not about other people and, and their stories. So that's really kind of why I got interested in that topic. And then from there, I presented, um, well, then, then COVID hit, like right around this time that I was interested in that. And all of a sudden, it's more relevant than ever. The need for it intensified. Um, and then that's really when I started sharing what I've been finding at presentations and from there consulting with other educators and, and other groups like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the need is there, right, um, in terms of mental health, uh, addiction services, um, people finding self-help ways to manage their stress, manage their anxieties, um, issues of grief and loss, um, all of these have then been exacerbated by the restrictions uh, that we've experienced during COVID. Um, there's a lot of uh, fear within the, I think, just general population of people. Um, then on top of that, during all of this time, a lot of social justice is issues have come to the surface, um, things that are, are critically important for our, our nation. Um, <clears throat> But we're more disconnected than ever, and so so as you're as you're thinking about um, supporting people who serve, 
right? That's what you're talking about. Like the students that you have in the classroom, the students that you have an in internship, right? Their, their goal is to serve, uh, be of service in a professional capacity. Um, but lots of people are given opportunities to be of service to others, especially during this time. Um, whether it's uh, being able to lean on a close friend, um, provide care to you know an aging parent, or you know, and for a lot of parents, they've been having to do extra kind of parenting work with their kids, um, being at home far more regularly and having to do school there. So um, this this issue of burnout um, and and. I get the sense that there's some compassion fatigue too when you when you talk about a loss of empathy or, or not being able to care for others and and thinking oh this I need something here I'm not getting what I need. Um, where's a starting point for people to really evaluate or assess like check in with themselves like yes. where am I at in terms of my own burnout or my own compassion fatigue as I'm dealing with how, you know, the the different roles and responsibilities I have. Yep. So where is a starting point? And I think that's such a great question. I think a starting point is knowing that it's a thing and knowing that it's necessary. Because I for a lot of people, especially high achievers, they just jump right in and they go, 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 go. And they are completely immersed in the work that they're doing without taking any time to check in. So I'd say a starting point is to check in. And to literally say, how am I feeling? What am I thinking? What do I need right now? What are ways that I can get my needs met or take time or get more support or take a break? What do I need? Because I think a lot of people don't do that. They don't even take the time to really check in. So I think what's really important, and, and I did this a lot during COVID, this was a lot of the work that I did, is to really sit back and notice your own thinking and to just sort of pause and do that. And a lot of people do that through prayer or meditation. They're kind of journaling, quiet reflection. But any intentional practice of just noticing your thoughts, what's, what's on your mind? It's a great question for yourself. And I think the more that I was able to kind of step back and observe that and just cultivate a pause in noticing what I was thinking, that that was some separation between what I was thinking and how I was feeling. And also noticing how I was feeling as well. I think it, it can go the other way as well of noticing what I'm feeling and then what I think about that. Um, so if I'm feeling anxious, why what's wrong with me? Why am I anxious? Those thoughts can, can add to the stress of it instead of saying, okay, I'm feeling anxious. Okay, that's okay. And I think another critical kind of starting point is accepting your experience, not judging or criticizing it. I think so many people feel an emotion and then don't like how they feel and then feel an emotion about their emotion, right? Like that primary and secondary emotion. So if I feel anxious and then I'm stressed or worried about my anxiety, or I feel depressed and then I'm anxious that I feel this way, or I feel angry and then I feel guilt, it becomes this emotional inception of a feeling within a feeling within a feeling, and people can be debilitated by that. So I think it's really cultivating this ability to observe our experience and to accept it without judgment and to say, this is how I feel and that's okay. It's okay to feel this way. And then from here, what do I need? Or, okay, where what am I thinking? Where are these patterns going? What's triggering that? And then just to notice it and, you know, observe it with curiosity instead of criticism. And I feel like that really helps balance people out. That really helps them not sort of just react in survival mode. I think another really important starting point that I teach a lot and I talk about a lot is really guarding your mind and really looking at the data that you're receiving and what sources you're receiving it from and protecting it at all costs. And this isn't unique to me. I didn't make this up. This is something that Tony Robbins talks about. Guard, stand guard at the door of your mind. Because right now, I feel like if we just sort of let our life and let society and let social media and the news dictate how we feel, it's gonna be a panic attack every moment. 
because there's so much anger and there's so much stress and there's so much disconnection. There's so many ideas that can come into people's heads and, and you know, create that cortisol reaction of stress and worry, being very protective of, of the influences that are that that your mind has. So just being intentional about that. I think just having intention in taking care of your mind is a great starting point. And that that's also a conscious choice as well. Um, so some of the ways that I have done this, I, I have no social media. Like it's very extreme because I, you know, I love Instagram and I love Snapchat. I loved Facebook. Like I love it. But I also could feel my affective state being influenced. So I just, I just stopped it. I, I used to love BuzzFeed and I also just, I deleted that app. So I just really guard the media sources that I have exposure to. Um, and then just also being aware of conversation patterns that can lead to stress and worry and anger and resentment and disconnection and judgment from people in my life. So I'm just intentional about where the conversation goes too. Um, what I talk about, what I think about, what I focus on. So I just think kind of in summary is knowing that it's a thing, creating this space and awareness and having this intention and, and then also just guarding your mind. I feel like that's the foundation. And and the, some of those choices that you made um, were very personal to you. I mean, they 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 came out of that space that you had created for yourself to really reflect on where you were at in terms of your emotional state and the things that you were focused on, um, the things that you were thinking about. And um, so you made some conscious decisions to eliminate some of the input. Um, I'm curious, what what did you replace that with? Um, sleep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I go also to bed at nine p.m. Self care. Yeah. Because I think you know, after kids are in bed and like house is cleanish, most people veg out. Like they go, get on their phones, they check their apps, they check their and they think they're unwinding. When yeah, they do that. exactly. But what I'm hearing you say is that that's actually a source of winding them up. Totally. Uh, by by doing some of that. Yeah, I knew someone who said, you know, I'm just having trouble sleeping. I'm like, well, what is your, you know, what's what happens before you go to bed? She's like, well, I'm looking at Snapchat and looking at the stories that are being filmed in hospitals that are, you know, where COVID is being treated. Okay. I'm like, okay, that mm -hmm. sounds really stressful. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel stressed just thinking I about know, that right, right now. Right? Yeah. So, so I replace it with sleep and, you know, conversations with my husband. I feel like that was a big social media time was after the kids are in bed. Um, and I don't know. I think, I guess, podcasts. That I'm really into podcasts and listening to my content mm -hmm. and having that kind of be the filler in my drive and as I work in my office and as I go on walks and things like that. I'd say different sources of content. Yeah, yeah, which... Um, is very intentional. Um, when, when you reflexively pick up your phone and go on Instagram, you don't really have, I mean, you, you've chosen who to follow and what to follow, um, but you don't really have any control over what you're going to see or mm -hmm. what you're going to read. Um, and that's so influenced by, you know, the, the story of the day or the week, um, what people are posting about. Um, and so it, it's kind of a, um, a toss up what you're going to get. But when you listen to something intentional, like, like a podcast, or you are following, you know, somebody and you're reading their blog, you know what they're going to be talking about. You know, the kind of information that you're going to be getting, you can be more strategic mm -hmm. in, in making that decision. So, so it's not, so what you're saying is it's not eliminating sources of information, but being strategic and intentional with, what you're choosing to expose yourself to and how much or timing of when you're exposing yourself oh, to yeah. those things. Totally. Absolutely. Because I feel like if it's if it's left up to social media, it's it's just gonna be a whirlwind of frustration and helplessness in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um and I just I feel like my mental resources are scarce and I don't want to waste any on thoughts or judgments or criticisms or frustrations or whatever other emotions are evoked on the in the content that I'm yeah. seeing. Yeah. 
I just feel like people are really uptight and wound up and stressed out and and social media can be a catharsis for them. Mm. But I feel like I almost take that on or, you know, I feel judgmental and I don't like that. I don't I don't like my reactions to some things that I see. So I just I cut that out and I do something else instead. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of on to that social media piece, um, <clears throat> you know, you're talking about connecting and connecting with your husband, um, connecting with a close friend. Um, the the author of Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I don't know if you've read that book. I haven't. It, it sounds great. Uh, yeah. I think it's Dr. Spiegel. He's out of Stanford. R- wrote this book. And it's all about you know stress and homeostasis and kind of these scientific things, but he does it in a really um, accessible way. So fantastic book. But <clears throat> he, in one of his lectures on the book, he talks about social media being a fruit fly form of connecting with other people. Um, and I thought that was pretty uh, pretty bold on, on the one hand for him to say that. Um, but he said in terms of um, regulating our stress, having good, strong social connections is one of the most important things that we can do. And we've kind of lulled ourselves into thinking that my Facebook feed or Instagram feed or Snapchat is meaningful social connectedness um, when it's not. And then the disappointment that we feel when we share something in a cathartic way that maybe we we would want to tell a close friend, but now we're putting it on social media and we don't get the validation or the empathy that we would hope to get, that disappointment is even is even greater than had we not even done that in the mm-hmm. first place. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what I'm I'm wondering um what what do people do to make strong social connections during this time when we're more socially disconnected, it feels like than ever. Yeah. I think that's a really good question. And I'm I'm still trying to assess that as well. Yeah. So I you, teach you don't you don't have the answer for that yet? <laughs> well, I think the first step is knowing that it's it's critically necessary for our health and well being. Yeah. Um, so how I do it is I, I ask my students like how is this class do how is this class going what do you need um, and I teach some I teach classes in person okay. so with social distance and and mask requirements being followed so I you know I talk to my students and just say how is college going how are you making friends um, are you finding ways to do that like what does that look like right now and every student that I've talked to is still. So I still they're I, finding a way. They are finding ways. Yeah. So some of them are on teams, some of them are in learning communities, but I think it's so natural for us as human beings to find ways. But I think one of the best ways that I encourage it is by instead of thinking, how can I make a friend because I need to vent? Or how can I make a friend for myself? It's really thinking about connecting and how can you serve others? Where is their need? How can you give back? How can you connect with others in a way that you are contributing in some way? And I feel like if we make it not about ourselves, but kind of this greater purpose, then we're more motivated and then it's more fulfilling. Um, so I guess I do that with my kids. Sometimes if if we have a free day and they it haven't happened in a while, I'll say like, this is our service day. Like, how are we going to help others? So we write mail and we deliver food and we just we find, like we connect how we can. And it did pivot a lot during quarantine, especially like with my parents is that we didn't we didn't gather with them. And if we did, it was in the socially distanced way, but we would still drop off treats, drop off balloons, drop off flowers, mm-hmm. um, just reach out, FaceTime, Marco Polo. There are some apps. I do use Marco Polo with my grandma okay, and she's 91 and she, she uses it more than me and pressures me to do it, but it's great. Like Mm -hmm. it's just a little video that I show her what my kids and I are doing. Um, so that's grandma approved. Yes. So so it's got a thumbs up. Winifred loves it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I just think it is knowing that it's necessary, knowing that our brains are wired for it, that that's, that's, we need this as a group. Yeah, we're looking for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then how, how, how we do it safely with people that who are in our family and just understanding the importance of physical touch as well. 
Um, I've listened to a lot on just how physical touch is one of the biggest ways that we communicate safety to each other and how this epidemic really puts that fear of touching other people and fear of being exposed to things by other people and, and just how how we could see the effects of this for generations yeah. ultimately yeah. because of epigenetics and things like that. So mm -hmm. so just knowing how critical it is to connect with others and have that community and then just being creative about what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, uh, I, I've observed this many times in the last couple of months of, you know, going out to a store, um, you know, throw my mask on as I'm walking in the door, um, there's announcements over the PA system in the store to maintain social distance, um, to wear your mask, and that's what's keeping people safe is distance. And now hearing you say physical touch is a primary way that we communicate safety, um, th these are two like um, two messages that are definitely in conflict with one another. So. I don't, I guess I don't know what to do with that when it comes to you know, like talking to my kids um, or explaining things like um, they, they would normally run into school that first day and give all their friends a hug. And we had to have a conversation like, you're not gonna be able to do that when you go into the classroom. And I know you're really excited. So, you know, we came up with some creative ideas of being able to draw a hug on a, on a picture. And, oh, that's and, brilliant. Um, or coming up with ideas of like air high five or those kind of things. Um, I don't know if you have other thoughts on that of just like, how do we communicate safety when some of our primary ways of doing that are pretty limited? Yeah. Well, I think it, it goes back to self-care, you know, and really feeling safe ourselves and feeling regulated ourselves. I feel like if, if those needs are taken care of and we ourselves are out of survival mode, even just the lens in thinking about others and reaching out to them and serving them, you'll have a greater capacity to do that. Yeah. So I'm thinking about, as we've been ha having this conversation, MSU is, is very, there's not very many people there. But when I do see my colleagues, just how are you doing? How's your day going? Trying to stay positive and supportive and really curious about their experience just to say I'm a safe person and I care about you and you matter to me and I see you. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're we're in a greater position to do that if we're not, if our needs aren't being met, um, if we're kind of screaming in our own minds as to like, I'm too busy and I'm too overwhelmed. If those voices can be quieted, we'll have a greater capacity just to serve others and to check in with them and see what they need. Like I'm not hugging my coworkers or hugging my students or touching them, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still saying, you matter to me and I see you and I have the the ability to support you if needed. And be because I have these strategies that I can do that for myself, I'm able to do that without it feeling overwhelming. And I think that's how I do it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then same with my kids too that I do touch them all the time. Yeah. Whether it's rubbing their back or giving them hugs or just cuddling. And I, I think I did that anyway, but it's just really understanding that that is such a safe thing. Um, a lot of people who use heroin say that it feels like, you know, a hug from a bear on a warm day, on a cold day, or like a mother's hug or like being in the presence of God. Um, so just really understanding what the oxytocin in your brain does when you touch someone else and hug your kids and that that's like one of the most safe things that we can do for them as well for their neurobiology mm -hmm. um but i don't touch everyone in my life yeah, right yeah. like i'm not just like stroking <laughs> people's <laughs> arms yeah yeah i well, might it, get arrested you know yeah, like that'd be right. creepy <laughs> <laughs> boundaries hello right. people in walmart yeah. and target <laughs> as they're announcing don't, yeah don't right. touch people yeah um, no, and that's it. Just speaks to how when if we if we don't have that in our life, that we're still seeking it, you know. And and whether that's through substance use, um, or I'm sure there there are I guess a multitude of other unhealthy ways that that people seek to have that need met. Um, but being able to uh, nurture that within a a, a family system. Um, 
within close friendships, those kind of things. That, mm-hmm. that's We can't lose sight of that at this point. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, really is, um, I guess, interconnected because we started talking about people that want to serve and then being exposed to all of the, the ugliness um, of addiction and trauma and mental health and, and feeling overwhelmed and burned out by that. And, um, and so these are people that want to serve, but then their capacity to do that is diminished until they find ways or discover ways or implement ways to take care of themselves. But then part of taking care of themselves means returning to that desire to serve. And, and so it's, there's a balance really between both of, of serving others and being able to have that compassionate care for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I don't know, I mean, however many hours there are in a week, is there, is there a balance here that, that people can strive for to say, yeah, I'm, I'm doing these things for myself and I'm doing these things for the other people in my life that I care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there is a balance. And I think one way to, I'm really all about kind of building blocks Mm -hmm. and there's no right recipe to do things, but I feel like if you can kind of start your day with a huge intention, I think having time to yourself in the morning is one of the most effective ways to take care of yourself and to um, really set yourself up for success. So a lot of parents, when I talk about this, are like, nope, I'm not going to do that. Sleep is too important. You know, I'm not sleeping through the night. Um, but kind of talking about this balance, if I sleep in for as long as possible and my kids wake me up, I'm going to wake up flustered, panicky, urgent. I'm going to rush through things. I'm going to like frantically get ready, frantically get everyone out the door. And then from there, I feel like that kind of automatically automatically puts me in that survival mode. I feel like choices will, you know, what I eat and how I talk to coworkers and mm-hmm. just my overall state will be changed as opposed to me waking up early, having time to myself, um, setting an intention, stretching, um, just kind of really checking in. And I know that that's a barrier for a lot of people, but in a lot of the self-help literature, there's loads of things written about this, of like the 5 a.m. club and things like that. But for me, that has really worked, is just kind of feeling grounded when I wake up, like having dinner planned, having my emails caught up, and then when the, and getting ready. And then when the kids are up, then I can be excited and enthusiastic and present for them. So I do feel like it's a balance between taking care of yourself to get ready to serve others. Um, And that I do it in micro ways as well. So I'm really about kind of priming myself and and changing my state and really kind of activating my body and my mind before I do something. So one example of another sort of self-care is that I have like mantras before I go teach just to help myself feel calm. Okay. Because I don't know if you've hung out with any Gen Zers lately, but they're a tough crowd to mm-hmm. lecture to. Mm-hmm. They And especially now when everyone's masked. Yeah. I feel like a lot of times when I lecture and when I give presentations, I draw off the energy of the audience. Like yeah. I crack jokes. And now I don't know if anyone's laughing, right? Like they might be, but maybe not. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like that's really exhilarating for me. And now that's not here in the same way. You don't way. get that feedback. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like I need to kind of prime myself in this different way that I'm, I won't be drained of energy if I'm looking at a masked crowd because that's what happens. So I think I do these mantras and I, and I consider this balancing self-care before I serve someone else that I, I think of things in my head. I, I position my body in a certain way. Um, I focus on specific things and I feel like all of those strategies prepare me to be confident and enthusiastic and silly and to have the mood states that I desire no matter what I'm doing. Um, So it is kind of finding strategies to get in the space that sets you up for success and that makes you most effective. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I find that balance. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it, again, it comes back to mindset for you in, in a lot of what you're talking about. You set your intention. You you have some specific practices that you're doing on a consistent basis to, to set your mindset. So whether that's getting up early and taking that time for waking up your body and your mind or before you go into a space where, you know, the all eyes are on you and and you need to be able to perform at a certain level and in a way that is congruent with who you want to be. So that's not going to happen on accident. Yeah, um, especially now. Yeah. It's this whole new model of education where there's students in person who are masked, there's students online live, and then it's all being taped. Yeah. So that just kind of adds, it kind of ups the game for me. Um, but what's been cool, a lot, there's a lot of resistance to this in at where I work of just like, this stinks and this isn't what I want. But I feel like really reframing it too helps me and just like, okay, how do I make this the best semester I've ever had? What do I need to do to really enjoy this, to really serve my students, mm -hmm. to be the person that it is on campus mm -hmm. and to really help support them through this? So I feel like understanding that why is so important. Why do I even do any of this? It's so I can show up for them. It's not so I can get a good te so I can be a good teacher for myself and my own ego. Like if if it was about that, then I I don't think I'd care as much. But I feel like these practices are necessary because the stakes are too high because of the populations that they will be serving. Right. So all of these things for me are a must. Like it's not like I I'll just kind of see what happens and walk in. It's saying I have to be at my best because I'm giving that information that could potentially save a client's life. And that matters a lot to me. So, and it's not like I'm that intense every single class period. Like Friday morning at 9 a.m., I still do my stuff, but I'm I'm worn out and things mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. I I also give myself a lot of grace in this too. But but I feel like having having a reason of why you do all of this, that's something greater than yourself, is really important too. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's almost like a way that I can serve others by by being my best self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have, having purpose and knowing your purpose, and and then doing, acting, deciding based on that purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what if what if I'm kind of past that point of checking in with myself? What if I'm already in that burned out state? What if I'm already in that state of like? I am so exhausted from this. I just cannot do it another day. I don't want, or I don't even want to do it another day. Like though, you know, if we're at that point, th then where do we start? Okay. So I think it, that really depends on like the type of job that you have. Like if it is possible to take time, but I do think, okay, first of all, it's, it's acceptance. Yeah. of that state of saying it is okay how you feel it's okay to be burned out like how you feel is okay because I think a lot of people would say what's wrong with me that I feel this way why can't I do it but other people can so just kind of accepting radically accepting your state and then really really a getting support I think that always helps to kind of authentically and genuinely share with someone that you trust like a supervisor or a friend or a colleague or your spouse, someone who's really gonna have empathy for you and support you and not judge you. Just be like, I'm burned out, I'm really worn out. Like, I can't do another day of this. In some ways, I feel like even just naming that and bringing that out, externalizing it and have someone say, that's okay. Like you've worked hard and it's okay to take a break if you need it. Do what you need, what do you need? What could help? And then from there, answering that question. So asking a really good question about what, where is this coming from? And if there's not a one specific cause of just saying, what do I need right now? Do I need a day? Do I need to sleep more? Do I need to um, kind of get therapy or journal in a different way or um, gain a different skill set? Do I need to shift the work that I'm doing so I can feel feel fulfilled in a different way? Are there other types of responsibilities that I can take on? I think a lot of times if you can kind of regulate that emotion, that some of these logical or problem solving answers can come to the surface as well. How do you, you know, 
change your work schedule or change your responsibilities or change your career if you need, you know. Yeah. Um, but just kind of taking the time, I think, is pretty critical. So if someone's burned out, they can't do another day, kind of accepting that and stating it, naming it, receiving support, and then kind of asking good questions as to what do I need and and what do I need to make that happen. It's a scary process, is you know, but it's a process. Yeah. Right. It's not something that I'm just gonna do. I'm gonna wake up one day, I'm gonna make that decision, and then it's gonna be immediately better. Yeah. But um there there could be a lot of fear and kind of entertaining these ideas of what changes might I need to make mm -hmm. in my life. Um but it what I'm hearing that that's a worthwhile process. That's a that's a a pathway back to to feeling well, to being well, um, and and it starts with reaching out. You're not going to do this on an island. We've spent a lot of time today talking about how important social connectedness is, and so when we're mm -hmm. in a compromised state um, due to burnout or other mental health issues, reaching out and seeking that supportive connection is, uh, I don't know, essential is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And being in a workplace that really fosters that, I think, is is critical. So I think the other thing, too, is understanding that growth is uncomfortable. So it's not like you'll just say, I'm going to take a trip to Duluth and all my problems will go away. Yeah. It's saying that it's OK to feel this. You know, this could be a message. It's almost like listening to your feelings and and hearing what they're telling you. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times they direct you to a different course of action. And that's not going to be like, oh, thank you, anxiety. You've helped me understand my calling in <laughs> yeah, life. Yeah. Like that's not comfortable. A lot of things that are worthwhile are a process. And it takes some, you know, transparency and some hard questions and some hard action. And that's OK. Yeah. So also kind of embracing that, that that's part of growth. And it's not going to be easy or comfortable. But the things in life that are worthwhile aren't. And you can't just have them because you want them. Mm -hmm. It's a process mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of a lot of courage. Yeah. Yeah. Courage and support and support and being able to do that, sharing sharing your intentions and um, having the people in your life that are going to help you be accountable to those goals. Because at some point, right, you're going to stumble along that that path. You're, you're going to say, yeah, this is what I want to do or this is this is a pathway, but then there are going to be barriers. And, uh, and you know, you spoke about that right at the beginning, right? That there are all, there were all these barriers for you that you had to in one form or another overcome, work through, set aside so that you could position yourself, um, to persevere when, yeah, it gets uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think there's kind of short-term and long-term interventions too. So if someone's really burned out, like taking a day off of work, figuring out what just fills their cup, what fills them with joy, what puts them in a different state. Yeah. And I think that's another really critical thing is understanding that we all have the capacity to change our state from frustrated and overwhelmed to silly and playful. Mm -hmm. Like we can do that by turning on classic Disney songs yeah. and being Taman and Pumbaa, you know, in a sing along with our children, <laughs> yeah. right? Yep. Not that yep. I ever do that. No, I'm course. usually Simba, just yeah, kidding. Okay. <laughs> but still like having those strategies of like, this stinks, but like, how can we be silly right now? Or how mm -hmm. can we have fun? Or how can I connect to my kids and make it about that yeah. instead of all the, the ways that life stinks and that work is overwhelmed and everyone is crazy? So I do think it's about our, a focus shift as well. So the short-term solution is changing your state. And then the longer-term solution might be kind of reevaluating the work that you're doing and making your interventions in those types mm -hmm. of ways. Yeah. But I love that idea. I think it's so cool that we can, you know, even by how we position our body, change our state, change our affective state. Um, and that when we are frustrated and angry, you know, we hold our bodies and we hold our faces and we have our focuses in a specific way. And if we're open and relaxed and, and excited, that's a different state. And if we're calm and peaceful and serene, that's also a different state. So it's, it's really having some tools to access those types of states as well yeah. and knowing that you have the power to change that even literally just based on how how you open your heart and and um how you breathe that is oh my gosh breathing to me is one of the best interventions possible for 
for self care in general. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just being yeah, intentional us, about that. Oh about man, it, yeah, I yeah. I just could talk all day about breathing. Um, but I think I just I'm listening to the podcast on purpose right now with okay. Jay Shetty, and he he just wrote a book that's called Think Like a Monk. So he was a monk for three years, and he still is really connected to that that group and that population. And he said the first thing that you learn in your monk training is how to breathe because your breath is the only thing in your life that stays with you from birth to death. That's all you've got. It's not your clothes. It's not your friends. It's not your family. It's literally your breath. Yeah. And how our breath is so powerful in controlling our physiology, our mood, um, and how just kind of that mind body connection is is kind of stabilized and grounded through our breathing. Another really interesting thought that I heard is that if you are in the survival fight or flight mode and you breathe intentionally, that's also a great way to communicate safety. Because if you're in fight or flight and you're being chased by a bear in the in the wild, you're not going to be breathing intentionally. So intentionally breathing is a great way that you can just communicate safety. So breathing is another tool that I use all day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm really mindful of that. And I really like taking deep breaths. Um, and I love that idea of just intentional breathing, whatever that looks like. Yeah. And and that it's real. Everyone says, like, take a breath. You know, it's used, like, colloquially sure. a lot. Like, sure. just breathe. Take a breath. But it's it's true and it works. Mm -hmm. And I also remember a time where I, I was leading a, a treatment group of women with addiction. And we were doing breathing exercises. And and you know, kind of had the lights down. And at the end of it, I'm like, you guys, how do you feel? And they're like, we feel so good. And I'm like, you just controlled how you feel. And you and this is free. This is accessible. This is with you all the time. And you didn't have to use drugs to do it. And one woman was so excited that she jumped up and started clapping. <laughs> like, that's how I feel yeah. about breathing. It's like a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest barrier is just forgetting that we have it's a tool that we have access to all the time. Yeah. But I just thought that was super cute mm -hmm. that she just jumped up and clapped. She couldn't contain her joy. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. But that is amazing though. And I yeah. think so many people do things to change their state, right? We have a beer, we eat something, we shop, we do whatever other kind of coping that that changes how we feel. Yeah. Yeah. And in reality, it, it's kind of with us always. Mm -hmm. And it takes practice, too. It's a skill. And I think that's important to understand, too. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're just born with the capacity to, you know, access our diaphragmic breathing. But it's it's such a great tool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so because it takes work, sometimes people shy away from that and they want something that's more immediate. And so when I come home after work, maybe grabbing a beer is a lot easier, quote unquote, than um, taking 10 minutes to sit in my bedroom quietly, breathing, centering myself so that I can be present and engaged with my family. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's It takes time and it's a process. And a lot of times if I do incorporate any sort of mindfulness or meditation with clients or students, they hate it because mm. it's uncomfortable to kind of be still yeah. with your mind. Yeah. So... So that's okay. That's part of it too, though. Yeah, yeah. There's right, and that kind of speaks to what you're saying that when we do something different, it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and and so the more we can maybe move toward that discomfort, um, that's that's when real change is going to happen. Absolutely, and I think just being intentional about making this change, and then just having it be a habit. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times we, a lot of what we do is so automated. Um, and even conversation topics can change our breath, right? Thoughts yep. change our breath. Yep. If we have negative kind of thought patterns, our bodies react. So I think if we can kind of hack that for the good, mm -hmm. that we know our minds and bodies mm -hmm. are interconnected. So how do we um, develop these tools in our body to help our minds feel calm and clear and compassionate yeah. instead of frustrated and anxious and overwhelmed? And I'm I'm willing to do whatever it takes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just thinking I'm really into like habit stacking. Okay. So trying to like, okay, if I walk into work every day, what can I do as I walk in that I, like something that I can stack on top of that? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I do is I I breathe and I kind of think about what I'm grateful for, and 
And I don't even have to think about it anymore that as I'm walking, all of a sudden my gratitude script is in my head that and that's like the one thing I've done. It's not like I have this all these great hacks for ev like yeah. brushing my teeth and whatever else. <laughs> but that's it. It just yeah. becomes so automatic, mm -hmm. just like our negative scripts can become automatic. So I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. But I didn't have it when I didn't go into work. So maybe that's a reason mm -hmm. why I'm on campus so much, because I just feel so good. You didn't have that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're 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 flooding yourself with some serotonin at that point, too, because right, like when we're in that like calm resting state, um, and we're focused on gratitudes or we're practicing some sort of prayer or meditation mindfulness, that's us tapping into those serotonin pathways, which of course, you know, always talk about how good that feels. Oh yeah. Um, and so you being able to do that in short bursts throughout your day, like walking into work, um, is just another example of a, a strategy that, that people can use to to help themselves, to take care of themselves. Yeah, and I do think it's great when it's something that you already do that triggers it. Yeah. And that's kind of the essence of habit stacking. Um, so something that is already automatic, that it's not like, oh shoot, I have to meditate now. It's like, okay, I'm driving to work and I'm really being mindful. And this is just what I do. Yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden it just, it, it just does, mm -hmm. you just do it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I was like, oh my gosh, these mm -hmm. thoughts are just coming into my head and they're good, right? Yep. And it's what I wanted. Yeah. And I do think, I know gratitude is talked about a lot in it kind is. of the self-help literature, um, but that's another tool that I've really, really focused on in my relationship, specifically with my husband, is really just appreciation. For, same with my kids too, and my coworkers. But I think specifically with my husband, because it's such a healing, healing interaction of a, being appreciative um, Brene talks about appreciation as being the foundation of joy, too. Mm. So instead of saying, you know, I think we have so many expectations, and I think that's the cause of a lot of our suffering, is that people don't do what I want them to do. People don't say what or act or the policies or people driving like morons. They don't do what I expect them to do. And I'm angry because of that. And I'm resentful and I am frustrated that we have expectations with how others should act and how we should act and we don't meet them. Mm -hmm. And really flipping that script, I think that comes out a lot in marriages and in partnerships where people are frustrated because their significant other didn't meet their expectations. And it's things as simple as unloading the dishwasher or taking out the garbage or changing a diaper, right? It's all these tiny things. So, But those tiny things are critical that's where the work is done. It's in the small things. It's not just in the global pandemic reactions. It's in the diaper isn't changed as quickly as I want it to be changed. Yeah. And how you talk about that and how you think about that really matters. Um, so it's, if it's really shifting that script of you're such a good dad and I appreciate everything you do so much and thank you for what you've done and really managing that expectation and almost surrendering my own ego when that isn't met I, that's still a work in progress yeah. trust me but so i'm like i'm just ridiculously appreciative of my husband i'm like you're just such a good dad like thank you and then i'm like is there anything you want to say to me <laughs> he's yeah. like i don't think so it has I'm like, to go oh. both ways it has to yeah but i just laugh <laughs> that's good that's good well maybe he'll listen in here <laughs> yeah all right, so let's let's try and land this plane here. Um, I'm I'm wondering. I know you talked about on purpose that Jay Shetty podcast. Yeah. Um, you know, you've you just made reference to Brene Brown and some of the the things that she's put out. Um, really good stuff. What what else are you really into right now that you're either reading or listening to, watching that that you want to share? Oh man. Are you sure you want to ask me this? Uh, yeah. Because this is like Hit what me. I love. Okay. Yeah. So right now on my reading list, I or like books that I'm currently reading, I'm okay. reading Joy at Work by okay. Marie Kondo. Okay. I'm reading Option B by Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant. And I'm reading Fast Feast. Fast Feast Repeat. 
fast feast because i'm i'm okay. really studying intermittent fasting okay. right now as okay. well so right. i feel like that could like we're opening a can of worms <laughs> and then podcasts i'm listening to work life by adam grant and on purpose yeah. with jay shetty and yeah. i really want to get jay shetty's book think like a monk as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. um i think that just came out like last yeah. week yeah so, it's been yeah it's this year yeah, yeah it's pretty yeah. new yep. um so that's and that's the other thing that i love is just kind of this constant personal growth like mm -hmm. it's such a process it's sure. not like i've arrived and i'm a self-actualized human but i i love studying what other people do mm -hmm. and the strategies that they've used and tony robbins always says like success leaves clues so really studying the people that i admire and picking up the clues that they leave i love that idea of yep. kind of doing that investigation yeah. i really like tony robbins as well mm -hmm. i kind of mm -hmm. got into him after reading Rachel Hollis's books, because a lot of what she talks about is inspired by him. Yeah. So. Well, that just speaks to your curiosity mindset. Yeah. I mean, it really does. You're one of the most curious people that that I've talked to, and and just really appreciate that about you. And I like that, and I like talking about it. I like sharing it. I like like if you ever come into my house for a play date, I'm always like, "What's inspiring you? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you working mm -hmm. on? Like, where is your yeah. passion?" Yeah. I like having conversations like that, and I that is fulfilling and exciting to me cool cool and w what have you got what have you got coming up in terms of things that you're working on projects presentations sure. um i have a webinar coming up in a few weeks for um a universe or for a college of on self-care and anxiety okay. for mlc i'm going to do a live webinar that they're okay. going to tape um other than that one thing that i've really been focusing on this semester is my teaching yep um we're switching to this education model that's called FlexSync, and a lot of professors are just all online. So I applied to be a mentor for this semester and next semester because our model is going to be moved away from online to FlexSync, so there's still some face-to-face -face interaction. So I'm really focusing on my teaching again um, and in really coming up with some innovative activities and ways to use Zoom and breakout rooms and kind of using technology to to really enhance student learning outcomes. That's something that I'm focusing on. Um, in, in higher ed, there's, there's different, like you could focus on research and community engagement and things like that. But right now I'm kind of back to teaching, which is okay. I'm teaching yep. seven classes right now, which is the most I've ever it's a taught. Big, big load. So yep. that's kind of consuming a lot of my energy. Another thing that I do is I lead our student organization. Okay. Um, and we have a meeting today. We're going to do a we're just kind of trying to figure out ways to build community at MSU through the pandemic. And mm -hmm. we're talking about just some informational panels and we're going to do a pumpkin carving activity. Awesome. So that's that's what I've got going on. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of good stuff. A lot of good yeah. stuff. Well, it's been awesome having you here in the studio today, getting to visit about these uh, topics. I, I Your passion for them is infectious. Um, so I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do that with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to be here and I admire this project and I think mm -hmm. that that this podcast will really impact a lot of people. So thanks yeah, for that's, that's having my hope. me. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe through your podcast app so that you automatically get the latest episode. I plan to publish one episode a week, every Monday. Also, consider taking a moment to review the show if you found our discussion meaningful to you. Good old word of mouth is great too. Let people know about the WellMind podcast and spread the word. During the show, Jenna and I made reference to a few different publications, speakers, and podcasts. Uh, you can find all of that information in the show notes page. Many thanks to the staff here at the Bethany Lutheran College Podcast Studio. Greg and Seth have been tremendous in providing technical support for this podcast and helping me get it started. And a special thanks to Lauren McMacken for designing the logo and cover art for the WellMind podcast. Next week, I'll be talking with an elite athlete, running coach, and mental health therapist, Benson Langett. He just recently completed the virtual Boston Marathon. Benson was one of 26 individuals across the country named to the honorary Boston Marathon team. And he finished in an outstanding time of two hours and 35 minutes. That still just blows my mind. He talks about his experience and preparation for this virtual event, 
and shares his wisdom on all things motivation, self-discipline, and goal setting. It's one you won't want to miss. Until next time, be well.